both in Somalia and in Kenya. This weekend saw yet another appalling attack in Belafoy, further evidence of Al Shabaab's cowardly and brutal regime of terror, and another salutary reminder that there are still those who want to deny Somalis the opportunity for greater peace and stability across their country. The UK will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with Somalia, the families of those killed, and the Ashton. But despite these recent attacks, I do still fervently believe that Somalia faces the best opportunity of a generation which we all, Somalia and its allies, should see it. Let me cast you back to 2010. Three years ago, Somalia was regarded by many as a hopeless case. The poster child of state failure, civil war, terrorism, and appalling levels of human suffering. I vividly remember friends and colleagues on hearing of my appointment asked why I would conceive of taking on such what they regarded as a poison chalice. Then came the appalling famine the first of the 21st century, and one that had ultimately a calamitous impact. I remember standing in Dadaab, talking to the newly arrived mothers, many of whom who had buried their children on the long and treacherous route from their communities to Kenya. And the images of shock and despair, their stories of suffering and tragedy, are ones unlike anything I have seen, save in Darfur. People have often asked me why the UK has taken such a strong and public role in and on Somalia. My answer has always been a simple one. It's born out of the recognition that the challenges in Somalia are not ones simply confined to Somalia, nor are they ones that Somalis should face alone. Terrorism, piracy, famine, these challenges transcend boundaries, they cross communities, and they challenge us all to do more and to do it better. International leadership by the UK is hailed by many as having helped stimulate the recent changes. Of putting Somalia back onto the international map after decades of being perceived as a forlorn and forgotten crisis. That's why in February 2012, Prime Minister David Cameron called world leaders to London to realise that the challenges faced in Somalia needed to be shared and needed to be addressed. Much has been accomplished since then. Most specifically, perhaps, expanded security with a stronger Amazon and a renewed political focus with a concerted demand that the almost decade-long, moribund transitional period should end. Today, the famine has abated, but millions remain in real need. The transition ended last September in a blaze of argument and knife-edge politicking. And having lived through the end game of the transition, all I will say is good riddance. Amazon, together with the Somali National Army, has expelled al-Shabaab from town after town. Piracy is dramatically reduced. I'm led to believe there have been more films about piracy this year than there have been vessels pirated. Consolidating progress will require long-term commitment, and sustained leadership from Somalia, from the region, from Somalia's partners like the UK. It will require brave and inclusive leadership from the federal government in Mogadishu and other Somali leaders. So, if the London Conference in 2012 was about ending something, so this past year has been about beginning something. A new chapter for Somalia, helping its new government, and as importantly, its people seeks the fragile but unparalleled opportunity now before them. This has been a critical year in Somalia. The first anniversary of Hassan Sheikh's government, the groundbreaking Somalia conference here in London, the first time such a conference has been co-chaired, owned and led by any Somali government. We've seen the Jubaland Agreement and of course the continued dialogue between Somaliland and Somalia, initiated here in the UK and now facilitated by Turkey. And, most recently, of course, the success of the Brussels Conference, designed to sustain Somalia's progress and continued stability. So as 2013 begins to draw to a close, we are at a critical juncture. Many Somalis often told me of the two generations of children that have grown up without access to schools, 
healthcare or jobs. Many would speak of the horrors that two decades of conflict had wrought at unimaginable human cost. The scattering of a population with over a million Somalis internally displaced, further 500,000 refugees in northern Kenya alone. It is worth remembering one salutary fact, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> if you take nothing else away from my words. 260,000 excess deaths are estimated to have occurred during the famine of 2011 and 2012. Somalia today is one of the worst countries in the world to be a woman, and one of the worst to be a child, with over 200,000 acutely malnourished under fives, where one in five children die before their fifth birthday. It's also one of the worst to be a journalist, and it's where life expectancy is just over 50 years, it's where 40% of the population live on less than a dollar a day. And the statistics for sexual violence in Somalia are appalling. That's why the Foreign Secretary made it central to the Somalia Conference in May, and why we're committed to working with the federal government and the United Nations to end the continued abuse of Somali women and girls. <coughs> but without this, Somalia's real recovery can never really truly be delivered. The end of the transition last year ushered in a provisional constitution, a new speaker, a new parliament, a new president, and ultimately a new government. Perhaps most importantly, leaders with a new compelling vision to take Somalia forward. First and foremost, though, every Somali I have spoken to since September 2012 sees an opportunity that they are determined will not be denied to a third generation, and of their desire to see Somalia stand once again on its own two feet. So seizing this opportunity is in all our interests. It's why the London and Brussels conferences of this year were not only about addressing the symptoms of civil war, piracy, terrorism, human suffering, but also about helping Somalis consolidate the hard won and fragile gains and create the conditions for more sustained and more sustainable progress. They were also about encouraging and supporting the Somali communities around the world, and particularly here in Britain. I've seen for myself the immense personal commitment and courage, the inspiring social and professional entrepreneurship, the vital role that remittances play, whether in Hargeza, Garraway, or Condition. These individuals, these communities, are as inspiring as they are necessary. Clearly, the announced closure by Barclays of their money service business accounts is of real concern to remittances in Somalia and to families that remain there. And I know my colleagues in the Foreign Office, the Treasury and DFID are working hard to find a long-term and safe solution to this decision. 2014 needs to be the year, though, when irreversible progress is made. Building the capacity of Somalia's own army and police and its judiciary so that people run towards, not away from them. Strengthening a judiciary so people can have greater confidence in seeking redress. Tackling the endemic corruption for which successive Somali governments have become infamous. Supporting the new federal government to set out what it stands for and demonstrate that it is prepared to spend its money on services, not self-interest, however limited those services might be. None of this, though, in my mind, is possible without progress on three intersecting issues. Justice, politics, and security. Somali leaders need to show they're prepared to act in their people's interests, maintain the momentum built by the end of the transition, and chart a way forward. Pragmatism, compromise, negotiation, all are needed. Enhancing security, though, remains the bedrock of this endeavor. As we have seen in the past few weeks, the threat of al-Shabaab remains real and real. To that end, Amazon is critical to creating the space to further weaken al-Shabaab, but alone cannot succeed. That is why the political strategy, Somali-led and owned, is so vital. Without this, any military campaign will at best tread water. And in this moment, there is a risk that different currents take over, from a resurgent al-Shabaab to a loss of popular support for the federal government or Amazon. 
At the same time, though, there has to be more focus on building effective Somali security forces. That's why the federal government, with our support and that of the European Union, the States, and the UN, put this front and centre at the Somalia Conference in London earlier this year. To put it simply, this isn't a choice between Amazon or Somali security forces. We need both. And the government needs to take forward And the government needs to take forward a political strategy that starts to make itself present, heard, and relevant beyond Mogadishu. Without a clear plan to 2016 that sets the conditions for the various political, security, and revenue sharing deals that will be required, without sufficient assistance to tackle the inadequacies of Somali <coughs> systems and make sure ordinary Somalis start to believe there is a brighter future for, them, for their children, then quite simply, this cycle of violence will continue. The dialogue between Hargeza and Mogadishu is a welcome move that shows what can be done. And I applaud both governments for taking these initial courageous steps. The road ahead will be difficult, but whichever destination ultimately is chosen, it cannot be taken without dialogue. And while the difficulty and sensitivity of the issues are understandable, neither party in Hargeza or Mogadishu can afford to be an island. Both are too fragile, both economically and politically. Whatever the outcome, they inevitably need each other. This, therefore, is about resolve. It's about commitment. It's about leadership. Not a single day in May or September or large international conferences. A word or two on the region. In many ways, with such large Somali communities and with such obvious strategic interests, EGAD has been the axis on which any progress spins. The commitment of Uganda, Burundi, Ethiopia, and most recently Kenya, to work together and with the Somali government has been considerable. This needs to continue. Ultimately, in many ways, this is all about trust between Somalis, between Somalia and its neighbours, and with the wider community, including the UN. Proving confidence and trust will be vital over the next few years. The UK has a key role here in helping bring Somalia and Kenya closer together. The contribution and role of EGAN will also remain central, with the close support of the UN, the African Union, and the European Union. Finally, a few personal reflections after three years as the first British, your ambassador to Somalia. Firstly, it was an enormous privilege. When I got home a couple of months ago, only really then that I was able to reflect fully about how much of an honour it had been, and also how tumultuous the past three years had also been. <clears throat> For when I first visited Mogadishu in 2010, it was still very much a city under siege. Battles would rage, house by house, block by block, not far from the airport where we built our first office, a handful of shipping containers inside the growing UN compound, and the first European Union member state to establish a semi-permanent presence there. Countless stories of the bravery of Somali and Amazon soldiers would be told over dinner in the mess hall but also of the refugee camps being established across the city, of the deprivation that thousands faced in the city as the horrors of the famine to cold. I remember travelling through Mogadishu in 2010 and 2011. Very few cars on the streets, even fewer people. You could pass through K4 in a single go. On my first visit to Villa Somalia, I remember being ushered into a small room by an Amazon Turkish embassy to say nothing of the attacks on the likes of the courageous of the Jama and so many other innocent people. Clear signs that security remains a real problem. But things are different. K4 is now a long jam with cars, donkeys, people, trucks. Shops are open all hours thanks to new streetlights. Hotels, restaurants, all are open. <coughs> Most powerful of all, perhaps, out of the back of Mogadishu Airport. On a patch of sand where Al Shabaab would notoriously execute people, this area has been reclaimed for early evening games of football. And I don't see the teams that play there giving up their pitch without a struggle. Slowly, the once beautiful city of Mogadishu is being reclaimed, rebuilt, and recovered. Colleagues from the SEO and from DFID are in Baidoa, Ismaya, and Galkaya. 
Elsewhere, the warmth, the welcome I received in Hargeza is something that I will always remember, along with the vibrancy and passion of its people, the entrepreneurship, the dedication, the commitment to Somaliland's bright future. In Garraway, again, a huge welcome invariably awaited, and long nights discussing both politics and history. There are many moments, too, of real pride. I recall sitting in the police training academy last September, watching history be made as the vote swung behind a new president and with it the end of the transition. For hours we waited for the voting to begin and then we sat for more hours in the sweltering heat of the September afternoon beside the academy as history slowly began. And that night, my colleagues watched in amazement as tracer rounds lit up the sky across Mogadishu in celebration. Until we remembered that what goes up must come down, and we retreated inside and watched the rest on TV, thanks to the safety of the UN compound. I recall, too, standing on the steps of the Somalia, on one occasion with the Foreign Secretary, presenting my credentials to President Sheikh Sharif as the first British ambassador. I'm standing there again only a few months later with Prime Minister Abdi Wali, sending off the Somali Olympic team to the London Olympics last summer. Their ambition, their pride, their courage was no different to the very finest champions and the spirit of the true Olympians. There was the inspiring Hargeza International Book Fair. Who needs hail and why? And always meeting so many Somali landers intent on making a difference. And on a very personal note, welcoming home the indomitable Jude Tebbett whose bravery and humility in the face of such a tragedy has touched and inspired us all. I vividly remember three flags. The first, the Somali flag being carried so nobly into the Olympic Stadium here in London last July. The second, the African Union flag standing next to Somalia's in partnership and solidarity. And the third, the Union flag the same flag taken down by Derek Seaton as Mogadishu was evacuated in 1991, being raised above the new British Embassy in front of both the Foreign Secretary and President Hassan Sheikh. A sign of renewed British commitment to Somalia and the end of 20 years of absence. Let me close by paying tribute to three very special groups of people. Firstly, to the various Somali political leaders on whom now so much rests. Somalia today is at a crossroads. What part she takes will inevitably be down to the choices her leaders make, the courage and commitment they demonstrate. Their task is daunting, but it is not a task for the shoulder alone. Secondly, to my outstanding colleagues drawn from across the British government, each has worked tirelessly over the past few years whether in Mogadishu, Hargeza, Nairobi or Addis, London, New York, Washington, Brussels and across East Africa. I could not have asked for a finer, more dedicated, more committed group of colleagues. And likewise, to my brave colleagues in the United Nations, the European Union and the AU, my sincere gratitude and appreciation to them all. And finally to my family. This job was unrelenting, frustrating, exhausting, it was also inspiring and totally all-consuming. It was also a huge privilege. For all the regular 4 a.m. starts, the 20-hour days, lost weekends, council holidays, missed school assemblies, and the challenges and sometimes dangers of living and operating in Mogadishu, to them, my sincere love and thanks. Let me finish by sharing something that the President, His Excellency Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, said to me a year ago. As we sat one afternoon in his office, he leant forward in his chair and said, Ambassador, we are turning a page in Somalia. But what we write there is down to us all. I wish Somalia and so many fine, proud, argumentative, hardworking, inspiring, generous Somali friends every future success. Like all of them, I know that the best days for Somalis lie ahead and not behind. Thank you all very much.
to make it to a TV talk and also Ken Mateas for anything around these issues that people want to bring up. I'll hand over the chair for this discussion to Michael Walls. Thank you, Elaine.